Aloha. Thank you for joining us. I'm Betsy Fuji Young. And I'm Marilyn Higashide. We are both volunteer docents for the Okage Sama Day exhibit at the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii. Please remember to hit the like button to subscribe to our channel to receive more content. Mahalo to the CPB Foundation and our other sponsors for their continued support. Welcome to the Cultural Celebrations and Local Heroes virtual tour. For this segment, we will honor our heritage, embrace our diversity with a sampling of local heroes and cultural celebrations. Marilyn will begin this segment with cultural celebrations. This Japanese New Year greeting means the new year has opened. Congratulations. Did you know that New Year or Oshogatsu is the most important family celebration in Japan? It is the time to finish up the old business of the passing year and the time to start anew. Here are some of the many traditions, customs, and rituals that hold special meanings for this most auspicious occasion. The last days of December are dedicated to osoji, or house cleaning. Everything is cleaned and family members all help to get the house ready to welcome the new year. The front door is decorated on each side with kadomatsu, an arrangement of bamboo, pine sprigs, and sometimes plum blossoms, which is tied together with a cord. This kadomatsu display dates back over 300 years to the Edo period. The matsu, or pine, is the main feature and symbolizes longevity. The bamboo represents strength and flexibility. Sometimes you may see plum blossoms, which represent new beginnings, purity, and endurance. Inside the house, people put up kagami mochi displays. A small round mochi is placed on a larger one, and the stack is placed on a clean sheet of white paper in the center of a sambo, which is a raised wooden stand. Lastly, a small orange or tangerine is placed on top. This fruit symbolizes a Japanese citrus called dai dai, which turns orange in the winter. The word dai dai also means generation to generation. The kagami mochi is placed anywhere in the house before New Year's Eve and later taken down and eaten. I remember mom putting kagami mochi on her sewing machine and later taking it down and soaking it for several days in water to soften. Later, she sliced it, fried it, and immediately put it in hot ocha, which is green tea, to further soften and remove some of the oil. Lastly, she dusted it in a mixture of kinako and sugar for us to enjoy this yummy, slightly crispy, memorable treat. Mochi, which literally means round rice, is an integral part of a New Year's celebration. And today, it is readily available in stores and markets. However, many years ago, families and friends would gather together to prepare the New Year's mochi in the traditional way. This event, called Mochitsuki, was a labor-intensive but happy occasion for all. Here we see the Morimoto family pounding mochi about 80 years ago in the Pawa'a neighborhood of Honolulu. Osechi ryori, or special New Year's foods, were an important part of a Japanese New Year celebration. Mothers would spend days preparing them ahead of time so they could relax and enjoy New Year's with their families. Now that we have learned about New Year preparations, let's start the celebration. In Hawaii, many families eat toshikoshi soba on New Year's Eve. This year-crossing soba is supposed to melt away the hardships of the past year and help you into the exciting new journey ahead. On New Year's Day, most families begin the day with a bowl of ozoni or mochi soup for breakfast. From there, families follow their own traditions. Many play traditional games like hanetsuki, which is similar to badminton. Another is a card game called karuta. 
When I was a child, my family began the new year with a bath. As I sat in the tub of warm water early in the morning on New Year's Day, I felt the significance of this ritual, even though I thought it strange since I had just taken a bath the night before. We had ozoni for breakfast, then changed into new clothes. Mom said we had to be brand new and squeaky clean from head to toe for the new year. Our family then went to visit relatives and family friends to wish them a happy new year. It was a fun time for kids as we got to play with other kids wherever we went. One thing puzzled me though, we were close to our grandparents, yet did not see them on New Year's Day. Mom explained that since Grandma and Ojichang had a fish market, New Year's was the busiest time of year for them, and they worked very hard in the days leading up to Oshogatsu. They were completely exhausted on January 1st. Grandma got up early on New Year's morning to make ozoni. Then she and Ojichang pretty much slept through the day. That's why New Year's food used to mysteriously appear on our dining table sometime in January or February. Instead of January 1st, my grandparents celebrated the New Year according to the old lunar calendar and would give osechi ryori to us and the rest of the family on that day. It was like a double New Year celebration every year. After the warm and happy New Year celebrations in Japan, winter days continue until early spring when peach blossoms start to bloom and families with daughters celebrate Girls' Day on March 3rd. It is called Hinamatsuri, which means doll festival. Parents and family members celebrate this special occasion by displaying beautiful traditional dolls on a platform covered with a red cloth and wishing their daughters much good health, happiness, and good fortune. In Hawaii, parents, relatives, and friends often presented girls with Japanese dolls on their first girls' day. I used to wonder why there were so many boxes with American dolls on the top of my parents' closet. To my delight, I had no end of dolls to play with. As I grew older, mom explained to me that in post-World War II Hawaii, Japanese goods were hard to come by, so relatives and friends gave me American dolls for my first girls' day. Putting up the beautiful doll display takes hours, and all the girls in a family are expected to help with this. It teaches them patience and how to appreciate and take good care of the dolls so that when they grow up, their own children can enjoy the dolls too. The Hina dolls are displayed on a seven-tiered stand covered in a red cloth. They represent the emperor and empress and their court and are dressed in typical court clothing of the Heian period 1,000 years ago. This beautiful display is traditionally put up in February and disassembled no later than March 4th. It is believed that setting it up early and taking it down promptly would bring a desired early marriage for the girls. A couple of months after Girls' Day, you might begin to see koi nobori, which are colorful koi streamers blowing in the wind on tall poles. Koi is the Japanese word for carp, and koi nobori is a symbol of Boys' Day, which is called tango no sekku. Each year, on May 5th, families proudly fly their koi nobori in front of their homes. The largest, a black koi at the top of the pole, represents the father. Next is a red one to represent the mother. Following that is a blue koi, which represents the eldest son. If there are more sons in the family, additional koi are added in order from oldest to youngest. Why are koi nobody flown outside on May 5th? Koi are believed to be strong fish and are admired for their ability and determination to swim upstream even scaling waterfalls at times. Besides being strong, koi represent longevity and perseverance. Never give up. In addition to flying koi nobody, families with boys display dolls representing famous warriors and heroes who embody courage and strength. 
After the Second World War, the Japanese government decided to lift the spirits of the Japanese people by respecting and honoring children and celebrating their happiness. They renamed Boys' Day to be Children's Day or Kodomo no Hi and made it a national holiday in 1948. Although we are aware that May 5th is now called Children's Day in Japan, many of us in Hawaii still like to celebrate Girls' Day on March 3rd and Boys' Day on May 5th. This is especially evident in preschools and elementary schools. Due to our year-round warm weather, you might see some children wearing cool jimbei sets to school on these days. As we have seen, Japanese traditions are full of symbolism and are infused with many cultural values that continue on to this day. We'll learn more about other festivities and traditions soon. Until then, let's learn about some cultural leaders and heroes from Betsy. Thank you, Marilyn. Your family stories really brought to life Japanese traditions as your family celebrated them in Hawaii. Now, let's go on to honoring some of our local heroes. In 1868, a courageous group of people were the first to migrate from Japan to Hawaii. We refer to these immigrants as the Gannen Mono, which means the people of the first year. 2018 marked the 150th anniversary of the Gannen Mono. To celebrate, the JCCH volunteers organized a historic event which brought descendants of the Ganen Mono together to talk story and honor their heritage. Tokujiro Sasaki Sato was a pioneer and one of the first Ganen Mono that arrived in 1868. He persisted through hard times by not returning to Japan, but made the Big Island his home, Gambare. As a pioneer, he led the way for Japanese immigrants who followed. Tokujiro married Kalala Kamekona from Kau, the daughter of an Hawaiian ali'i, or chief, and eventually learned Olelo Hawaii. Tokujiro and Kalala were some of the first people to bring taro farming back to the Waipio Valley. Sixty descendants of Tokujiro attended the JCCH's 150th anniversary of the Ganen Mono. Third, fourth, fifth, and even sixth-generation descendants were in attendance. They truly represented the diversity of local families here in Hawaii today. Much later, Steer Noda with the Asahi baseball team came to fame by helping popularize the great American sport of baseball among the Japanese communities across the islands. In 1905, as baseball began rising in popularity on the continental U.S., Steer Noda founded the Asahi baseball team here on Oahu. Steer Noda, a Nisei born in Eva on Oahu, was only 13 years old when he founded the Asahi Nisei baseball team with a group of young teens from the Kalihi Palama area of Honolulu. He was nicknamed Banzai Noda. Noda served as the team's first southpaw or left handed pitcher and was a star hitter. In a 1970 interview, Noda explained. The team played inside baseball, utilizing a lot of bunts and squeeze plays to score runs. The team capitalized on their speed and skill, serving as the equalizer for their lack of size and power. The boys played with perseverance, heart, and mind. The Asahi baseball team demonstrated that Hawaii's Japanese players could compete at the highest levels against other teams. The Asahis became the team to beat. In 1968, Steer Noda was awarded the fifth class order of the Rising Sun by the Japanese government for his role in promoting goodwill and friendship, which began from the very first Asahi Japan tour in 1905. The love of the great American sport of baseball spread across the islands, and the neighbor island of Kauai was no exception. My early childhood recollection and connection with baseball hits close to home. 
My uncle Dai, who was my dad's youngest brother, lived with us at the time. From the time he was very young, Uncle Dai was a constant tag-along with his six older brothers because of his strong desire to play baseball. Through the years, he honed his skills. Uncle Dai was on the winning Lihui Bakers team during the big-time inter-island baseball games. Batter up! For our next hero, let's embrace our diversity and honor Maui-born Jesse Kualua. Jesse Kualoa was a trailblazing Native Hawaiian in the sport of sumo. Jesse was the first foreigner to enter the traditional sport of sumo and became known as Takamiyama Daigoro. In training, he started from the ground level, worked very hard doing humbling menial tasks. Jesse persevered and he finally debuted in 1964. He became admired for his go-for-broke spirit and gamang, quiet endurance. No matter what his injuries might be, he carried on. Through the 20 years of rigorous competition, Jesse set numerous records and climbed his way to achieve Seki Wake, Sumo's third highest rank. Jesse provided the shoulders of a giant sumo wrestler to stand on for those who followed. He was the first foreigner to found and take charge of a sumo training stable. Many credit Jesse for paving the way for other local sumo wrestlers like Konishike Akebono and Musashi Maru. We remember Takamiyama Daigoro, Jesse Kualoa, for being a leader in the sport of sumo and true ambassador of the Aloha spirit. Who would you name as a local hero today? Who is making our world a better place? Who is inspiring our communities through sports, space exploration, advanced medicine? Who are the women making a difference in our society today? Who would you name as a local hero. Our ancestors came to Hawaii, became part of the community, and learned the meaning of aloha. Aloha is the essence of relationships in which each person is important to every other person for the collective existence. The Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii serves as a vibrant resource of the Japanese and Hawaii experience rich in history, culture, values, traditions, and the local heroes. It is our hope that you have been inspired to reflect on your heritage, embrace our diversity, and share the spirit of aloha for all people. Mahalo. Mahalo for joining us. Please remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more content. Mahalo to the CPB Foundation and our other sponsors for their continued support.